Ja, das geht. Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, my name is Ellen Übel, member of the board of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. We are looking forward to a very exciting evening. Knesset elections, very special. It's always about war and peace, a central point of um, Israeli policies. Uh, but the historic geopolitical undercurrents uh, and intricacies in the political sphere are so complicated that it is not easy uh, for political observers to come to a clear uh, realization estimation and uh, even more so during the, this electoral campaign. That's why we are offering to discuss this election. We will be uh, checking uh, whether we'll have some statement or electoral results rather at uh, uh, 21 hours German time. Um, but uh, we will have uh, um, so estimates, uh, projections regarding the larger parties, uh, but uh, there will be no final result because you have uh, 42 electoral lists. Uh, we have a 3.25 percentage hurdle uh, for parties. Um, and and uh, of course, we don't know how many of the parties uh, running for uh, 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 this Knesset uh, will um, exceed the threshold. Is not clear. Netanyahu has had a couple of uh, uh, coalition crises survived uh, last uh, year when the coalition was dissolved. It appeared that the uh, result of the election would be foreseeable. However, uh, like uh, always in life, there is surprises. Three developments have changed uh, the uh, situation. Announcement uh, of uh, uh, a um, corruption uh, proceedings against uh, Netanyahu, uh, the growing, uh, the developing of a political competition, uh, a coalition of parties under the uh, um, head of Ben Gantz, former head of the staff. Uh, and of course, there's a fear of a new Gaza war. And uh, here, the there's the strategy now um, to no longer look for a, a peace with uh, Palestinians. And that's f falling Netanyahu on his feet. And uh, that's what we want to discuss. Uh, also, uh, domestically, dissatisfaction is. Uh, uh, with Netanyahu is high. At the same time, uh, economy is uh, thriving. Uh, the relationship with the United States are excellent. Now, what does that tell us? Um, uh, there are, of course, some that are saying there will be no electoral uh, victory of uh, Netanyahu. There are other aspects, though, that are important for the uh, Israeli population. How was the electoral campaign run? What was the uh, subject matters raised? Uh, the situation of uh, the uh, Israeli democracy, gender issues, economic policies, what influence uh, Israeli Arabs will have on the electoral result? What? Uh, can be expected in terms of uh, domestic and foreign policy. Uh, these are all questions that we want to discuss with uh, experts uh, that we have invited, uh, which are welcome at this point. Uh, we um, uh, have uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Kinet, uh, Dr. Peter uh, Lintel from the SWP, and uh, Stefan um, here, uh, the head of our offices in uh, Israel, the Bainik Bosch Foundation. We will uh, start uh, uh, with a live uh, uh, transmission here from uh, 
Israel. Uh, we will um, talk to Maizam uh, Yachuli from Itak Mak Maki. And the introduction to all of this um, is going to be delivered by Ofer Waldmann. And I would like to thank the, N, uh, the National Israel Fund uh, in this context uh, uh, for organizing with us this um, uh, event here. Ofer Waldmann is an Israeli uh, journalist living in Berlin. He is head of the board of the NIF in Germany. At the same time, he is postgraduate on German history and literature in a joint uh, course of study with the Hebrew University uh, um, in Jerusalem at the Free University of Berlin. He is also a musician. Um, and was in the West uh, Eastern and Ivan, discussed in the RSO and the German opera, and many more things, many more important orchestras. So that will be the first part. And in the second part, we will be uh, uh, doing some trying uh, to analyze the electoral campaign with the, our experts here. Um, and in the last part of this event, then it is uh, 9.15. Uh, of course, you will also be invited to uh, raise questions, uh, uh, deliver comments, etc. And we hope that then there will be uh, a, a video conference with Dahlia Scheindlin. Uh, she is on her way from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in her car, and she will give us a, a, a impression on uh, the, the, the electoral campaign, uh, on the results. So a first response, so to speak, from, from uh, Israel. And then we will um, discuss that then on the panel. And after all of this, um, you are cordially invited to um, move to the ground floor uh, for uh, snacks and, and drinks and uh, discussions and uh, oh, share views then. So a jam-packed evening, so to speak, program. Um, and now we have Mr. Offerman. Um, Will you introduce her? Then I'll uh, spare me this and I'll pass the floor on to you. Thank you. Ellen, thank you. Um, uh, the Israel uh, National Fund has built up. Uh, Israel done a good job, and uh, but, but I'm not working for it. I'm working for the new Israel Fund, and um, and they're also paying a little bit. Don't worry. So, um, dear friends, it is always nice uh, to talk about a, a, a country that is so dear to us, and it's always good to do that together with the Heinrich Böll Foundation, our partner in Israel and Germany. And uh, actually, I wanted to tell you that I have managed to bring to paper a coherent uh, thought. I have uh, voted in Israel. I um, jumped on a plane and said here um, that I didn't manage uh, to uh, bring down a, a clear thought. Um, uh, on a piece of paper, uh, journey to Jerusalem, is it about this or is it on the bit? Parties, is it rather about the small party or the 3.25% hurdle, who will make it and who will not? And, and well, the Arab Israelis, whether they uh, go to the ballot or not, the news that we get uh, are not so good. Uh, with my uh, um, my daughter, she's eight years old. Uh, I passed by, you know, Likud, Meretz, etc., Labour Party, and she got a, a sticker from uh, for Likud, and kids like uh, uh, these stickers, and, and for Meretz and the Likud man. Um, 
uh, so young and so left already, how deep can you fall? And he said this to an eight-year-old girl and looked at me and, and didn't quite get it. So, and asked, where are we? Yes, and the only democracy in the East, in the Near East. Um, again, I will continue with no coherent thought on these elections. Um, I will uh, comment. Uh, Channel uh, 12 uh, analyst on the Y said that uh, the discussion between left and right in Israel is, uh, is whether the time works for or against us. I would expand this uh, question to include in the question who is meant uh, uh, with us. Is it people who want a democratic Israeli-Palestine uh, state, uh, one state solution people? Uh, uh, is it um, uh, fantasy uh, uh, implementation uh, uh, for uh, the advocates uh, of the two-state solution? Time um, works against them. More settlements, etc. For the one-state solution advocates, the time uh, is uh, for us, is working for us, irrespective of which direction it will take. Uh, um, uh, think of that guy that uh, jumps from the 100th floor and in the 50th floor he said, so far so good. That's the one-state solution situation uh, currently in Israel. To be, be not to be, be, that's the question. Comment number two, no, it's not. Because we have Gidon Saar, Naftil and Bilge, and David Jaquet are behind him, who are even more extremist than he is. Uh, they're not even uh, uh, less corrupt, so they wouldn't be driven out of office, um, even though they are not so politically smart. Netanyahu, uh, in his survival fight, which is not political, but yeah, rather a legal battle, has uh, thrown overboard all his principles. Um, uh, in the last electoral campaign, he's released forces that tear up Israel um, and the society. And these are forces that cannot be brought uh, under control so easily. And uh, even if you uh, have a different view of, uh, than, than I have or the NIF has, there are people in, in Germany. Uh, of course, um, uh, people are very hesitant in Germany in terms of criticism of Israel. They will be facing um, a, a parliament in Israel uh, with a racist policy with, with, with which uh, universal uh, human rights are something that is interference that needs to be fought. And also in the democratic uh, uh, side, uh, you have to say farewell to racist uh, uh, ideas and have genuine uh, coalitions with Arabs. And they have to say that they are citizens of, uh, um, of Israel and they have to seriously talk about uh, core coalitions, uh, even though they give them some legitimate to the Israeli system. Uh, Jewish or democratic? Comment number three. You have uh, understood that uh, the, uh, the occupation is long, long to be brought in line with the democracy. Um, um, the, 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 the laws for the person are not to be brought in line with democratic uh, uh, principles. So you have to decide. Uh, but the uh, choice is not between Jewish and democratic, um, with, uh, but rather Jewish democratic and a Jewish nationalist. It's a um, choice between a fake uh, um, state and um, uh, if you think of the national state, uh, a bill that was passed last summer. Uh, wasn't uh, passed because of today's situation. It was passed um, with a view to an action of West Jordan. Um, that's why this bill was passed. So uh, if um, Israel has a, a thin um, Jewish would have a similarity, then the Jewish character would be um, uh, maintained in these countries. Uh, comment number four, identity politics. The dealing with identity politics in Israel has to come to an end. Uh, uh, you are a Moroccan Jews, you uh, vote for Bibi. You're Orthodox, you um, vote 
not uh, Bibi and you are um, middle class, you uh, vote center uh, uh, left. That's been so in Israel for decades. And if you look at the Israeli demographics, uh, then uh, we can pack our bags from the um, peace uh, um, parties here. We have to um, cut this Gordian knot. The only possibility to do this is a, a place where you talk about human rights, social uh, justice, uh, women's rights, um, which holds true for Orthodox women as well as Palestinian women. And that place would be the Israeli civil society. And already yesterday, but also today, the Israel civil society because it, democracy is grassroots and we have to support this. Bull does it and uh, IF is doing this. All NGOs that you know uh, do um, uh, support this and we support all of these NGOs with our world uh, worldwide. But this is an only opportunity uh, to r support the peace uh, 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 side in, in, in Israel so that we can overcome the situation, hopefully. Thank you. So, is it my son? Nice to have you with us. Hello. Good evening. So, I will uh, introduce you, if I may, in German. Uh, Maisam Jajuli, a Palestinian Israeli, has an M.E. in criminology and uh, education. She participated in different campaigns also for women's rights as a member of the Hadash party. She is in the board of several uh, different uh, organizations of Namat uh, and Sekoi and standing together. These are three organizations. Nahmati uh, is also supported by the Bell Foundation. In front of so many social and political struggles, is there a common goal or a common challenge you can see in your work in all these organizations you're active in? Yes, of course. I see a very huge common goal. Our common goal is reaching to, uh, to justice in the Israeli society, reaching to an equality in the Israeli society. And this is what are trying, we are trying to do in all the organizations that you mentioned. And tell me, how does the Israeli civil society confront the time now before and during the elections? What are the challenges that we're confronting during these elections? It's a very hard election for the civil society. Uh, the amount of uh, of hatred that the Israeli right wing is pointing for the civil society is huge. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, talks about the civil society that encouraging the Arab voters to go to vote. Uh, this is, uh, um, I think, this is the worst thing that we, the worst election that we are facing in the civil society, because Netanyahu and the Likud and the right-left parties, you know, are all the time, all the time just talking about us and how, how we are supporting the Arabs. Um, you talked about the, you talked about the Palestinian society in Israel. Um, there was a huge discussion. Actually, in every election, we have this discussion. Will the Arab citizens vote or not? Will they stay at home or not? And if we're looking at the, at the numbers now, it looks as if the, um, the participation of the Arab Israelis in this election is very minor. How do you, how do you see it from your standing point? Actually, you are catching me with tears in my eyes. I think that this is a black day for the Israeli democracy. 20% of the Israeli population, which is the Palestinian Israeli citizens, have no faith, no more faith in the Israeli democracy. They don't believe anymore in the Israeli democracy. And, you know, because of that, we see the, the very low, low rate of uh, uh, going to vote. The people 
they didn't go to vote. They are the rate of voters in the Palestinian society Israeli is 40 percent till now, and this is very bad for the democracy. But and I think that there is a, a a big possibility or, you know, a huge possibility that our parties, the parties that represents the Palestinian society in Israel will not be in the Knesset. And this is will be a very, a very bad day for the democracy, the Israeli democracy. Um, a last question, Maisa. Uh, last summer, uh, we were confronted with the national state uh, bill, with the national state law. And there was a huge demonstration in Tel Aviv, and we marched together, Jews and Arabs, against this law. And there was a feeling that there might be a beginning of a new Jewish-Arabic partnership. Do you think it's still possible? I think that this election, the, the, the results of this election, will be building this Arab-Jewish uh, political, I don't want to say party, but political work together. I think this is our only chance, because yes, we are very depressed about the uh, the election today, but I think also, and I think that the, you know, the, the beautiful things, if I can say a beautiful thing about this election, is that uh, the willingness of uh, the Jewish left side and the Arab left wing to go together to build a new uh, politics in Israel. Because this this is going to be our day and we must take it with all of our hands. And I believe that we can do it. Jewish and Arab together. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a, some, some, it, it will be a call of waking up so we must be to wake up our uh, activists, Jewish and Arab, in order to, to do the right things together, nothing separate. Thank you very much for your uh, words of uh, hope. Actually, in this difficult day, and uh, I think we all send you our send you our uh, strength and forth and kol tov v'litrot nitrei b'Israel. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. So, well, Ellen, thank you, Ofa, with my son, Jal Yuli. We got a first insight as to the mood, but I think it's important to look at the whole field of parties. But before we do this, let me introduce our guest, Ruth Kinet. She is a journalist and an author for broadcasting stations from 2008 to 2013. She lived in Tel Aviv and worked as a free correspondent of the worldreporter.net. And she reported about Israel and the Palestinian territories. She still observes the situation on the ground, traveled there regularly. She is an historian, a politician, a philosopher. She studied in Augsburg and Berlin. And actually, she was born in Belgium and worked also on colonialism and Congo. We are very really pleased to have Peter Lintel here. Now I really have to get it right. The project he had is, is called Israel in einem konfliktreichen regionalen und globalen Umfeld, innere Entwicklung, Sicherheitspolitik und Außenbeziehung. This is the title of the project. And we will be aware of his precise analysis until 2016. He worked uh, at the pol politics chair uh, and she, he studied in Haifa and Tel Aviv and does research work uh, about political orthodoxy. 
I'm also very pleased to have the head of our office in Tel Aviv here. All our heads of office are currently here for strategic talks since 2018. Stefan Hagemann is in Tel Aviv before he worked as an assistant professor for political sciences at the Technical University Kaiserslautern. He wrote his doctoral thesis at the Free University of Berlin about German-Israeli relationships and the U.S. policy in the Middle East. We are very pleased to have you here as an expert on our panel. Well, this picture, which is difficult to bear. We do not want to discuss it now, but let us look at the whole field. So uh, what is the situation of the candidates of the 42 different lists, Peter Lintel? We also brought a graphical uh, 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 a graph, a table actually, Perhaps you can explain what parties stand a chance. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. As you can see, it's complicated. I do not want to dwell on the different parties, but more the party blocks and the dynamism we currently see. Well, basically speaking, you have a right, right extreme ultra-orthodox block and another one. Uh, Palestinian parties on the left-hand side, center parties. These are the blocks that compete for power. Currently, uh, a pure right-wing block is at the helm. The question is, what happened during the last few weeks at the center left side, there is a new contender, Benny Gantz, and he stands good chance, uh, well, about 29 to 31 uh, seats. And the issue is a government that is based on the common good, on the rule of law. And he says Netanyahu leads the government as a, like a kingdom. So this is the major issue of the left wing forces. So otherwise, the center left movements wants to stop the erosion of democratic principles. The big dynamism is among the right-wing parties, and you see it in the three parties listed here. They have doubled their voices now. Currently, we have uh, three new radical right parties. They are all for an annexation of the uh, uh, West Bank. And these parties also want to transform the uh, Israeli democracy. So uh, they want to have the division of power, checks and balances, m m and no, no more minority rights. But these parties want the parliament to determine without any uh, restrictions. This is the big danger 
in the current election campaign. So this shift is faced by the civil society. We heard it from my some from the perspective of Etachmaki Steffen. Perhaps you can say something. What does this mean? What was described by Maisam in combination with this shift to the right? The mood described by Maisam is widely spread also among our partners somewhere between resignation and despair. On the one hand, these elections are seen as being of central uh, importance because it's about the future of the Israeli democracy. Kahola Van uh, does not stand for it offensively. I mean, they reject Netanyahu and corruption, but Kahola Wan uh, doesn't uh, focus on the defense of democracy. What is important is to see the changes for a very long time. Also, the Likud complied with the uh, democratic rules. Uh, this is currently questioned. And Likud says, uh, liberal democracy, this is the uh, democracy of left-wing forces. And this is very dangerous. At the same time, we have a discourse of delegitimizing the left, which is identified with the failure of the peace cause and organizations who, that work for human rights against the occupation get under pressure in a public campaign. Ofa also said it, uh, well, to be called left, this is now an insult. There was a cartoon when uh, where two kids insulted each other and one kid said, well, you are a left winger and the other child started to cry and the mom interfered. And uh, well, uh, there's only one party that really says we uh, are left wingers and we defend it and that this uh, party could not get into uh, the Knesset. Itakmaki is also one of our partners. We also have a campaign against the Palestinian population in Israel and their political participation. There is a kind of ambivalent process. Netanyahu has uh, launched a social political program, 922, where where considerable sums are invested into Palestinian communities for some economic reasons because the Palestinians are also to be integrated into the labor market. But then the nation state law was uh, approved and the law says the uh, Israel is a Jewish state and this was seen as a kind of ideological stick by the uh, Palestinian population. Many want to participate more. We also see a rise, the uh, uh, 3.25 threshold was introduced to keep uh, Arab Palestinian parties out and they then uh, went together 
in the Arab list, we also see the party here listed on the left with an Arab party which is prepared to take on political responsibility but uh, these uh, attempts were delegitimized by Netanyahu. And as Mesam said, as long as there is no cooperation center left with these parties, it will be very difficult to win a majority. So this is one of the projects that must be prepared by the civil society. There is cooperation. When we look at the municipal level, we see other uh, election outcome so that mobilization is possible. Um, I think we'll come back to that later. Uh, let's come back to the um, to the election, to the electorate. Who uh, mobilizes um, which constituents? Um, Ofa talked about the identity politics. Um, well, they said, look, you are from Morocco, you uh, vote for Likud. Uh, is that so? And what is uh, uh, the background? So, and, and, and how, does it, how is it reflected in election campaign? I'm not uh, certain whether this um, uh, thesis of identity or, or policies is, uh, is uh, true. I heard an interview recently uh, in the typical Israel radio, which is so dynamic and so fast. Now, people were called at their homes um, in where these families uh, are divided into various uh, different political uh, uh, sides. So the father is Likud and the daughter is Meretz, and they uh, had an argument. Um, I'm not sure that uh, there's uh, so these clear cut delineation. In 2015, I had the impression that uh, um, electoral campaigns uh, used identity politics uh, much more. But I would like to come back uh, to something different. I agree with the skepticism and with these concerns, and it brings tears to my eye when the Arab uh, uh, Israelis uh, boycott the elections. And with the reason, uh, it is uh, heartbreaking because there's an enormous uh, potential among the Israel. Uh, the uh, Arabs, there is a process of uh, Israelization. There's many Arab uh, Israel startups which are very uh, successful. There's a new generation of Israeli Arabs who have uh, no, um, don't fancy uh, to perpetuate uh, uh, and pass to their kids uh, how they grew up. Um, I would like to uh, point out to uh, uh, this year the fact that they have so many political parties running uh, here uh, is a sign of the uh, of the vigor of Italian uh, of, of uh, Israeli uh, uh, democracy. You um, questioned uh, that Israel is the uh, only democracy in uh, the Middle East, and I'd say it's not a question mark; it's an exclamation. But yes, it is the only democracy. Um, there is a lot of potential there. Uh, I heard um, a new expression that I didn't know. Um, that uh, people shouted at one another. Uh, the election day is a holiday. Uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, um, a festive occasion, and that is a potential you can work with. Um, uh, at least it is a wish that you can uh, formulate. Um, I'm quite certain that uh, this night will not bring us clarity. I'm quite certain that this is so, and it will not um, bring us lots of uh, of reasons to be uh, happy. But 
I would rather uh, uh, already indicate that uh, these elections are not the end of Israeli democracy, hopefully. Uh, again, the question, where are the voters um, that are mobilized? We have focused on the question, do Palestinians vote, a boycott? Uh, resignation, despair, uh, no confidence, no hope. <coughs> we know that among the Palestinians there is the thought, okay, we would uh, uh, also be part of the political process. But at the same time, we see enormous polarization. Uh, what's the reason for that? Uh, what strategies did political parties choose in order to mobilize their electorate? Um, the, the subject matters, the, the strategies, uh, maybe we can comment on this or uh, uh, go into more detail. Uh, I would like to respond to what uh, Ruth was saying. Brother, mm. I'm not saying that uh, uh, Israeli democracy is liquidated, but it is changing. Um, uh, Open calls it a liberal democracy. That's the way it goes. Uh, no protection of, uh, of minorities. The majority counts, period. And if you look at the pol political party program, then you read this in there. I, wouldn't, I want, didn't want to say more than that. Um, why are people uh, appealed by this? Is there this defamation of the left? Why is that so successful? Oh, I give you three reasons. Because they're not a majority. <laughs> The right wing has a political majority, so they don't care about the minority. Fact. Second, uh, which Devon was saying, a left, liberal, pacifist, peace uh, uh, has been discredited since the Second Intifada. You can uh, watch how the peace movement uh, were, has been discredited because it has no realistic uh, opportunity uh, more or chance in, in and that is the the feed of Netanyahu and other right wing people that was linked to other uh, uh, domestic liberal person that was that link uh, Jewish identity and security that are the central aspect of the current electoral campaign if you vote left if you vote liberal you uh, put in danger Jewish identity or oh, if you vote for merits, um, then you have the uh, Dash coming with their pickups uh, occupying Israel. No. You want an ethnic Jewish state. And that's the polarization. And that's what they're driving here. And also in the electoral campaign, uh, one of the major subject matters there is a conspiration theory that there's a deep state. Netanyahu's indictment, leftist elites, uh, which were no longer in power since 1970, still control the press, the judiciary, um, and can't get rid of Netanyahu democratically. That's why they're trying to do this via indictment, via the press. And that is the other polarization, you know, uh, uh, project. So the, le the left put in danger a Jewish identity plus um, getting rid of uh, Netanyahu. Netanyahu has been in, in, in power for, for 10 years. Uh, um, and uh, this discourse is very popular among the right. It has to do with the identity politics. That Avodah, for example, or Meretz, uh, um, view to be Ashkenazi um, uh, uh, mid-income uh, uh, party. Uh, one last uh, 
uh, with the Kibbutzi and with the Estatut, one lost power, so they were weakened. Avigawai was before the Kubitz movement, there was a half empty hall. So there's no power center anymore. And the left uh, is, is not capable of, you know, of offering an alternative. So there's an uh, ideology and identity crisis and there has not been a solution found so far. And the first intent of Gabay when he took over party uh, leadership was to move to the right. And the strategy will not work. Didn't work in Israel, will never work. So, so a little offering here. Um, uh, um, solving the Israel uh, um, Palestinian conflict and social and economic uh, issues there is no alternative um, offered by the left and we have seen little discourse and discussion about that in the electoral campaign even though there would be so much to discuss we have a devastating report about the uh, devastating situation of uh, the mass transport we have a transport minister who has been in power for 10 years is not capable of setting up a proper uh, infrastructure. It was, um, and if you move to Tel Aviv in the morning, you are g stuck in the, in the, in, the, um, in the traffic jam for hours. Yeah, well, in uh, Jerusalem and yeah, maybe in Tel Aviv you will have a tram in a couple of years. But uh, yeah, but um, the, this image of Israel as a startup nation is not uh, uh, real. Eight percent of the Israeli workforce is in the high-tech sector. Uh, this reality of this glittering, uh, you know, uh, startup world is hard. Both parents have to work if they want to have kids and want to survive, um, and if they don't want to run. Uh, the credit to an all-time low, you see? So uh, that played enormous role in the last electoral campaign. I betted on it that uh, for the first time, economy would beat security, but it didn't. And this time it wasn't even discussed. Um, had no weight in the electoral campaign. And if you look at uh, Cajol Laval, uh, this blue-white uh, side that has uh, um, uh, developed, and if you see the posters, it's a dream world of a macho ideal world. It is the macho, it's the military guy, you know, that um, stages uh, himself. Uh, female voters, I mean, what what offering does that have for them? So it is, it is um, <coughs> rather meager here, this offering. Uh, Cajol, um, under, from, of the first 20, it's six women, and uh, Nathan Niles uh, listed three women among the first 20. We are working with Tahmaki Anan. Who want a gender budgeting implementation, uh, equality here? Yeah. Look, uh, there's successes. Gender budgeting is uh, uh, passed and is now uh, implemented in the ministries. In a electoral campaign where security is central, where you have generals running for office, uh, there are other um, uh, issues are sidelined, and women have a hard time as candidates as well. Uh, just look at Zip uh, Livni. Uh, uh, um, she didn't run. Uh, uh, following that uh, uh, alliance with Abu Dha uh, fell apart. Uh, so she was ex uh, executed in public. It was a horrible scene before cameras. Um, and also, uh, Sibylivni has never managed to get the trust. Uh, 
that has to do with the security issue and with the militarization of society at large. So um, people trust in men when you talk about security. And, and in cases of representation, where there was some progress, uh, there is a backlash now um, with this electoral campaign. I can only agree. Um, now, um, let's go back to the economic and social policy. We had um, a big movement in Israel. Many people took to the street in Israel. Um, people uh, uh, demonstrated against uh, uh, the rents too high, etc., uh, cost of living too high. Uh, of course, that increases the pressure to move into the settlements here. Um, many families, for social and economic uh, uh, reasons, have uh, uh, no other uh, uh, way but to move into settlements. So how can that be that this is uh, um, pushed uh, 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 side um, in this electoral campaign. How big is the income gap? Um, how much injustice is there, social injustice? How is that waiting yeah, between the big social issues which continue to be there and which will become even worse? and the dominance of the security discourse. How do people deal with this in everyday life? Look, the uh, satisfaction of Israelis' um, general quality of life is quite high, I think. Um, and therefore, it is a very strange uh, discrepancy between that uh, um, everyday uh, uh, fight for survival, um, keep on track with the family, etc. But there is family structures that support much more than you could uh, conceive of here in Germany. If uh, there are toddlers, that of course it is a matter of course that the grandparents are on board all the time and help whenever possible. Um, and so that uh, balances uh, uh, problems out. And also, in the public discourse, there is uh, this, this uh, angst to reflexes. Uh, that's the only explanation I have. Because at the end of the day, security is always top issue with all the passionate political discourse and argument in the public uh, space, um, that security always um, is the tilting, um, uh, uh, the, the tipping issue. So it is not a matter, of course, that the state exists. And this danger is always underlined by certain political forces, but it is a real danger uh, with all the criticism that uh, we uh, voice here. Uh, we have to always envisage uh, that uh, Israel uh, continues to be a state that is in conflict with the neighboring state and is threatened. Uh, I wouldn't want to know how uh, the voters would vote in Germany if they had a similar situation. The rest I can only uh, support. Gefahrenlage hin hinaus, dass um, I uh, assume uh, that this situation, uh, well, uh, look, this threat, um, Netanyahu um, uh, plays it masterly, this tune. Uh, and he says, oh, well, uh, the Arabs come in, in droves and they are. Uh, um, uh, you know, driven to the to the appalling stations in buses, etc. Um, and the two uh, poorest, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, parts of society are the ultra-orthodox 
and the Palestinians. Among the Palestinians, the fact is that they They don't identify with the state. It has to do with the economic situation. They, there are ultra-Orthodox people that are don't voting for ultra-Orthodox parties, but the ultra-Orthodox, they, um, they don't care about their poverty. Um, because they live in their segregated neighborhoods and they cope. So the and that has a different uh, um, effect on the voting. And we had a strong focus uh, with regard to Netanyahu and smaller parties suffer from it, uh, parties that address the social issue. Looking at Netanyahu and his foreign policy position, well, one has to say he is one of the best foreign policy strategists. Uh, his track record as to Iran, Syria is good. There have never been less fatalities. Uh, he has a great relationship with the U.S., with Putin. Well, uh, where should one see it critical? Perhaps one has to differentiate between his foreign and his security policies. The relationships uh, Israel has with the states uh, is better than ever, with the exception of Europe. But uh, Israel has never done better in the field of foreign policy, and many give the credit to Netanyahu. So he is a very smart foreign politician, but also the global constellation supports Netanyahu. So the uh, U.S. have made a U-turn uh, from Obama to Trump. And then there is the confrontation with Iran, the uh, Sunni, uh, Sunni states, get closer to Israel. And this is a big foreign policy asset. R recently, we had an Indian fellow at the SWP, and India really put its foreign policy from its feet to the head. So uh, they supported the Palestinians, but now they say we are not against the Palestinians, but we want to have good relationships with the Israelis. So the foreign policy presence and a good track record at the expense of the Palestinians and the two-state solution. Yes, the majority of the Israeli society sees it. The support for a two-state solution is declining compared to other alternatives. Perhaps there is still a majority, but even those who are for a two-state solution are convinced that it can not be implemented now and that the costs would be much higher than to keep up the status quo. Uh, looking at the different security analysts, the situation is much more precarious than perceived in public. We saw this at the, when there was a rocket alarm in Tel Aviv. 
uh, people said, well, what kind of uh, car alarm is this? Uh, until they uh, realized it was a rocket alarm in Tel Aviv. And also, when it comes to the Gaza Strip, it's not an alternative that is uh, provide, uh, provided by Kaha Lavan. They say, there, well, there's a kind of uh, Hamas provocation, and then there is a counterattack by Israel, then there are negotiations. And Netanyahu uses this to deepen the divide between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And uh, Halon says, if we want to overcome it, we ha need a military operation against Hamas. And then we have to reconstruct it, which may be a tantamount to a reoccupation of the Gaza Strip. This would lead to major costs, so it's no uh, viable alternative. As to the West Bank, we uh, have to be aware that there are strong forces in the current coalition that want to continue the process of a slow, gradual annexation. And it's not only these small right-wing parties, but it's also Likud. Likud also said 28 of 30 uh, MPs are in favor of an annexation. Uh, and Netanyahu now also agreed these are announcements that need to be taken seriously. Looking at the Israeli population in Tel Aviv on the beach, you do not get the feeling that nearby People suffer from the occupation, and they were pushed further away because of the wall and also because of the political discourse. How have things changed over time, the perception of the conflict by the population? Well, this bubble was expanded. It exists in Tel Aviv and also intersections and to make it impossible to meet in Yafo uh, Jews and Arabs live together, and now uh, Jaffo sees a traumatic gentrification process. Jim Jaram, in an impressive travel report, made excursions to the other side uh, places the uh, Isra an Israeli would never visit, and uh, she he reported about it and said uh, and he comes from a very political committed family, and many things he saw he wasn't aware of. So the segregation policy has proved to be very successful. When we moved to Israel uh, at the end of 2007 and got our accreditation, we uh, talked to the head of the press agency about the peace process when you come from Europe, you always ask about the peace process. 
And uh, then it was said, what kind of peace? It's about shaket, calm. So the aim is no longer peace. The aim is calm. Uh, to be able to uh, drink lemonade on the beach of Tel Aviv. I'm not cynical. People want to be left alone. Uh, on the one hand, there is the high speed of life, the high economic challenges, the intensity of communication, and now you should also deal with the conflict and with the question, what will be the future of this state? And you may be quite happy to have a group of uh, four ex-generals that promise you can uh, continue uh, your life on the beach also in the next five years. The development of the two-state solution comprises four, three to four stages. Uh, in the 90s, a majority of the Israelis expected to see a Palestinian state. Then there was the second intifada. And uh, when uh, suddenly there was no partner for peace. So uh, this was a big break. And the majority of the left forces said, we have to separate from it. Now there comes the third stage after the disengagement. Many uh, draw the lessons we have to withdraw, but we cannot withdraw because then they will shoot at us. And this was good for Netanyahu because he is the master of conflict management. And now there may be a fourth phase, annexation. And the regional uh, situation also plays a role. There is a rapprochement to the Gulf states and Netanyahu. Uh, the offer was to normalize uh, relationships uh, well, uh, for uh, regulation of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And Netanyahu hopes he can do without uh, regulation of this conflict. I uh, do not think that this will be possible, but this uh, also plays into the hands of Netanyahu. There is one more question we have to raise, and then we will open up the discussion. We have heard many tweets from the White House that had an impact on the election campaigns. And now there is the miracle weapon about the peace plan. What is known about this? Well, what is known? Uh, only little. But of course, you can deviate some things. Uh, Netanyahu, who said one state, two states, whatever, this already tells us something. And with the uh, US ambassador freedom, he supports settlements the recognition of uh, Jerusalem as a capital and of the Golan Heights are clear signs. So uh, it's not about a two-state solution, but rather about economic peace. Uh, big financial package 
is to be offered to support the Palestinians, but it's not about sovereignty and a state. I heard, I'm not sure about the figure, several million Palestinians are to get Jordan nationality and that also the Egyptian uh, adopt Palestinians. And I think nobody asked the Egyptians and the uh, people of Jordan. There is a lot of imagination, wild uh, fantasies. But I think it's not about a two-state solution, but uh, more uh, state minus, but no real sovereign state. And for the Palestinian side, this is not acceptable. Well, there is one mobile mic, so uh, please feel free to ask questions, make comments, the gentleman. Well, I have a thesis and one request. My thesis is that the time of Netanyahu is over in half year or one year. He will no longer be head of state. Either there will be new elections or some other is uh, elected. And please agree whether you speak about Palestinian or Arab uh, Israelis. I think half want to be called Arab Israelis. Well, I would like to raise a different issue. In Europe, we have the uh, movement of children for climate protection. Has this movement also reached Israel? Couldn't this be a strategic link? in the uh, civil society uh, between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis to come together under this motto. We uh, discussed that he is a general and he makes no offers to women, I wonder that uh, Rabin was not mentioned in this context. So he uh, underwent a completely different development. And a second point I cannot understand is the attitude of the Palestinians, the uh, Palestinian woman we heard. She is hoping for a glorious future after the election. Well, how can this be possible uh, if they do not even go out to vote? I understand their mentality. Uh, but uh, if they do not uh, go out to vote, I mean, uh, the elections are an opportunity, aren't they? Yeah, I would add to that uh, question. We Palestinians uh, voted in 2015. We were in the parliament. What was the result? Nothing. Then, then came this, this uh, law, Jewish state. That's why we are saying, that, look, um, uh, representation in parliament didn't help. So what do you expect from the Palestinians? That they go uh, to the polling uh, and then you get these, these laws imposed on you? Thank you. Um, first, uh, you know, um, answer, uh, question has been answered. And you said you were a Palestinian, Israeli? You said you were a Palestinian uh, Israeli. So we still need to um, uh, 
clarify the question where we talk about Arab, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Israelis or Palestinians. And I understood this, uh, this question was very interesting about Fridays for Future. Uh, maybe we can talk about this. Um, uh, uh, Ruth, maybe you want to uh, comment on this one? And the Rabin question, uh, or which uh, uh, is to be in the context of, uh, of uh, expectations of uh, Palestinian parties. Yeah, this uh, Arab and uh, Palestinian. Uh, I, I always talk about Arab Israelis working on Israeli territory and have Israeli passports. And I asked an Arab Israeli this question who, and this interview was the toe and throw and he's played with this and then we played with that uh, terminology. And then he said, well, what is it depending on what you use? And he said, do I define myself as an Arab Israeli? Well, every time. Uh, there is an event that uh, um, tries to reduce me, um, to reduces me to a uh, um, um, second-class citizen. Then I respond with this uh, um, prow pride uh, that uh, and say I am a Palestinian uh, Israeli. So, um, well, who asked that question? Yes. So they're oscillating uh, uh, between the two terms. The moment you talk about Palestinians, you you say it's you, me, and you. So politically, it 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 has so much content. So it is important to stick to this term. Sorry, that was off the mic, yeah? So we can't translate this, we can't hear it. There's Friday for Futures in Israel. Abima Theater, Friday, 12 uh, o'clock. If you fancy going there, I recommend you go there. Um, well, this is uh, uh, climate change and energy issues are, uh, um, of course, uh, active uh, in Israel. We have lots of potential solar energy, for example, but this potential is not being used. Uh, we have lots of coal, uh, dirty fuels that we are currently using and continue to use. And then you have these gas uh, deposits that have been uh, um, uh, 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 detected uh, that's being propagated, but, but as we uh, but we know uh, that gas is not a a, a clean uh, fuel, but rather uh, even a more dirty uh, 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 fuel if you consider methane. Um, so it's on the agenda of climate change. Um, it is a bit uh, transversal to polarization, and the Knesset. Um, Across polarization, across poles, you can uh, forge alliances. And also on the ministerial level, uh, there's uh, also expertise uh, uh, collected. Is that not a political question? No, it is not viewed to be a political question. And, uh, but it is not um, used. Um, or like water, access to water. Um, things that could bring Palestinians and Israeli together. Uh, conflict, including occupied territories. Uh, this could have po potential for positive developments, but this is not being discussed. Um, that's uh, well, also the Palestinians in the occupied territories uh, 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 shrug that off. So there's no response to Israeli uh, activities in this regard. But it is also in, uh, so green technology to, to be developed is also an issue in, in Israel. There are interesting uh, startups, there are interesting uh, companies are working on this. 
Then we had the question why we didn't talk about Yisak Rabin. Well, we have been talking about, not been talking about many things, but we should use it as an occasion to discuss this complicated and ambivalent uh, relationship of Arab Israelis when it comes to polling. Two different questions. Uh, and on, on this basket that uh, Netanyahu's time is over, uh, yes and no. Of course, he's under pressure, but I believe that Netanyahu's step to uh, announce uh, uh, sovereignty over settlements, um, uh, because he says, I've uh, always been against uh, annexation against that French law. If you give me immunity, then I give you uh, annexation. So I can imagine that this happens. At the same time, in uh, Likud, there are some who want to get rid of him. So, uh, the other questions. Gantz and Rabin, both are or were generals. Rabin uh, didn't uh, showcase the social issue. He was uh, murdered because uh, of his intent to bring about a two-state solution. The, uh, the climate in the Israeli society was different. Uh, there was a left majority. There was two parties, or three parties only, uh, having a majority, but that is gone. Um, so Israeli society is frustrated about the peace process, doesn't uh, uh, believe uh, in the peace process, doesn't uh, trust the Palestinians. He, he, and he, um, and uh, Rabin said, yeah, let's talk about peace again. Um, or oh, Gans, sorry, Gans said, let's talk about peace. Um, and he is not Rabin. Um, but um, from a point of view, the, the situation in society is completely different and it has no majority. I would say no. Um, because history um, shows that it's not linear. Um, and the extrapolation of today's situation into the future, I would not accept this. There is potential. Gantz has potential to develop this and take the society on board. Um, but this uh, rupture uh, with the murder of Yitzhak Rabin cannot be um, um, cannot be, you know, valued enough. It was for and after. And for the peace movement overall, uh, it was a decisive. It was a turning point. And also for the political culture in the country. Um, Rabin, when he had lost the majority in the parliament, uh, he was supported by the Arab parties. And the second time, when a center-left uh, politician uh, Yehud Barak, a direct uh, election of the prime minister. Uh, he was only elected because the Arab uh, Israelis supported uh, Barak. Yeah, 97 percent, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, during the era that you described, Netanyahu was one uh, that lost the political debate because he was one of those who mobilized against the peace process. Uh, now, more questions. The gentleman in the last row on the bench. Thank you, Apostle Lady from the young Federalist Greek. I have a musket and a question. The uh, marginalized minorities are rarely motivated to uh, go uh, to the polls because they believe that they have no say in, in the destiny of the country. We have that uh, um, in Europe as well. Roma and Sinti are discriminated against and almost never 
uh, go um, vote. Uh, so I don't know uh, why people are so surprised that the Arabs are not uh, uh, willing to uh, vote, um, specifically uh, following that uh, 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 Jewish national state law and the role of language. Um, we talk, didn't talk. Uh, we talked about the settlements, annexation or not annexation, and we didn't talk about corruption. I have the impression. Um, people focus on corruption and the status of the settlements, that's it. And in a country where people are so educated, um, um, economy, environment, etc., don't play a role. I mean, I would love to hear more about themes that are important in other European country elections, of quality of life, etc. Um, why is that not? Thank you. Um, we talked about the uh, dominance of the security issue already, um, I think, going to your question. And here we uh, collect a couple of more questions. Uh, Friede Grützmeier. I would like to ask for your panelists' point of view. Uh, Offa Waldman said that the uh, party where Palestinian and uh, Jewish Israelis jointly uh, fight for a two state solution, that you could see a future in that. How do you view this? Michael Bromlik, a gender political question to all of you. You said that the military uh, soldier like presentation of what uh, is is not an offering for women. Israel is, uh, I guess, um, the only state in the world where all. Uh, uh, women have to go uh, and do military service. Uh, on the right wing uh, extreme uh, uh, side, we have Karl Glick, Alechayet, and Miri Yegev, who, strangely enough, um, offensively bring a fascist uh, women uh, uh, image uh, uh, and, and link it to some fragrance. Uh, Professor Brumlik, this is a contradiction I cannot give you any solution and, and answer to. Israeli women serve in the army. And why is there no Israeli woman uh, running uh, for office here? Um, not not one on the billboards. I listened to the radio programs intensively recently, and there was this argument time and again. A party offers identification in, in the billboards. And there was only men that were on these uh, posters. And so is a question to the strategists of the political parties. Why such a limited um, personnel that is being offered? Why no women in the uh, uh, list? Well, security policy-wise, according to the polls, they are very right wing, and the uh, generals are an offering which is attractive for females as well. What we don't have is female generals extending such an offer. And civil uh, women um, are not uh, seen to be authoritarian in terms of and competent in terms of uh, security. And the new right. 
this is a quite interesting development because there's a division the of labor. Evil Jacquet uh, was um, the justice minister is to uh, uh, be victorious vis-a-vis -vis the um, um, uh, Supreme Court. So we have this division of labor. Um, between civil things and military uh, security things. Um, this argument uh, is reflected by uh, the career of Sibi Livni. She had a military career, but she could never score points. Uh, let's come back to Mayram uh, Jalul's question. We see uh, different uh, turnouts. In 2015, we had an increase in turnout. It is decreasing this time to do with the fact that the offering is different, that there is deception. Um, people are dissatisfied with uh, the results of that United uh, List's results. And, and just to do with the racism uh, that played a role in this electoral campaign. Um, but are alternatives uh, being developed? Uh, of course, it's important for the future, but I would, uh, that would need to start on the civil society level. Turnout is 40, 64 percent until 8 o'clock. Now um, people um, are becoming uh, uh, nervous. First results are coming in. Um, just briefly, um, th this basket, everything needs to be worse before it gets better. Uh, well, uh, this fragmentation between Arab parties had to do with seed distribution, but also centrally with the, uh, the, the question, do we want to work together with the Zionist parties or not? Uh, this way, why Hadash uh, Qatar, um, you know, said, for, but they want to see the results. Uh, maybe... Maybe you see uh, more cooperation in future then. Maybe that wasn't uh, a wrong assumption. Let's talk about the question, how can it be that we have uh, such a electoral campaign with the uh, themes that in all other liberal democracies would be decisive. Social issues, <coughs> health, education, economy. Why is that obviously not decisive for this, uh, for this electoral result? Maybe I would try to answer it, but maybe we can have another go on this. There are surveys. What is the most important uh, question? You say it's asked. Economy. Is it decisive for how you vote? No. So over the last 25 years, we had uh, a polarization. Am I for or against a Palestinian state? So that was left, right, divide. That's the socialization. That economy and other things are important. Everybody knows that. But that doesn't produce any polarization. That's the background for this, I think. Uh, we have to relatively punctually uh, turn to Dalia Scheindlin. Um, let's have another round of uh, questions. But don't be sad if you don't get all the uh, your questions answered for lack of time. We talked a lot about annexation, uh, which was a campaign issue 
Well, annexation with rights for the Palestinians, or will it be an A, B, C annexation? Will the Palestinians living there become Israeli nationals? And as to Jordan nationality, as far as I know, many Palestinians in the West Bank have already uh, Jordanian nationality. So what could you imagine? Because Likud and other parties are talking about it. I would like to know in how far the situation of the Palestinians who are marginalized can lead to action because it is a provocation. Uh, let me r uh, remind you of the article by uh, Bettina Marx. Uh, where she said that the Palestinians were marginalized. Wouldn't it be possible to take up this issue and what, and this brings me to my third question, is it possible to do something with the right wing camp. I mean, 500,000 settlers cannot all be of the same opinion. Where are their points uh, where we can work for human rights in future? I heard many things with which I disagree. Sometimes I got the impression that the opinions of the Israelis were not reflected enough uh, by uh, talks with individual Israelis. But I think economy plays a very important role. Many Likud voters say, well, uh, what is your problem? Uh, we are doing very well. Uh, people are traveling abroad. This is often an argument to support Netanyahu, in my family, my father is, of course, an absolutely Kutnik, and he is disappointed of his daughter. Uh, he always tells me, uh, well, you have to come to Israel to vote. But I know people who vote for the right parties, and the economy plays a role. Well, we have three interesting questions. Well, settlers, are they all right wing, and are there possibilities? to talk with these people about human rights. But let us now uh, go to Dalia Scheindlin. Uh, you will see her picture. Dalia is one of the experts for and analysts for opinion polls. So she has a lot to do 
tonight as an advisor for strategic communication. She uh, carried out political campaigns in 12 countries. In Israel, she works for different local and international organizations. She is a doctor of political sciences. And uh, she is a co-editor of the Tel Aviv Review podcast. And one of our partners uh, of an online magazine, 972, we support. Now we try to build a connection with Dahlia. Dahlia? Thank you. It's nice to be here. <laughs> okay, this is uh, uh, interesting to uh, to notice that this is allowed in Israel. So we are delighted. Um, I'm, my name is Alan. <coughs> we met uh, some uh, uh, months ago in Tel Aviv, and uh, with me are um, a bunch of 200 people. Perhaps is listening. And of course, uh, uh, we are interested in the atmosphere and in the first uh, results. Uh, which information can you give, Dalia? Well, this is good timing because the first results have just been published from the exit polls. We have to be very careful because the final mm -hmm. count, but it does look like Likud and Blue and White Party are very close to each other. In one of the polls, blue and white has a uh, one seat advantage, and in another poll, even slightly more. And of course, the big question on everybody's mind is the size of the ideological blocks, the right wing parties mm -hmm. against the center yeah. left and Arab parties. Mm -hmm. We have three television channels giving us those numbers, and in two of them, the right wing block is ahead, which was predicted all along. Mm -hmm. However, in one of those mm -hmm. uh, television channel exit polls, the two blocks are running at 60-60, exactly even, out of, of course, 120 Knesset seats. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at, uh, in one case scenario, a cliffhanger, you know, a very mm -hmm. suspenseful mm -hmm. uh, poll showing the two blocks almost even, exactly even. Yeah. Two other channels exit polling showing an advantage for the right-wing blocks exactly as the opinion surveys predicted and I will and, and also several interesting developments in terms of parties that currently are not crossing the electoral threshold mm -hmm. and certain parties that are crossing the electoral threshold uh, we again yeah. we have to wait for the final count because so many of them are mm -hmm. you know within a percentage point of, of you know crossing or not crossing so this mm -hmm. is uh, the, the current update as of just 10 minutes ago. Can you, uh, you mentioned that one has to be cautious about the exit polls. Can you uh, explain why? Sure. I mean, yeah, most of the history that I've been working on Israeli elections. Oh, the Dalia, the. Since 1999, which is 20 years. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Daniel, the, the, uh, the connection is, is very. Together. They showed the. It's very yeah. This is the, always the problem with Skype. We should prefer FaceTime. So if there is no. Daniel, it's it's very difficult to. Which is a major difference, but can be explained yeah, easily. Yeah, it's but. it's very different to. The connection is very bad. Dalia, can you hear us now? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because we didn't hear. I tried to ask you why you uh, <coughs> mentioned to be cautious about exit polls and why is that? And uh, then we lost uh, connection. Yes. I'll try fast because we're going into a tunnel. Yeah. But okay. in, 2015, <laughs> the polls, in 2015, the exit polls were frankly wrong. The two parties got neck and neck results. But in the morning after the real count, Likud was ahead by six seats. So mm -hmm. that was very different. In the in the longer term past, yeah. the polls have been more accurate. But sometimes they're not. Okay. Okay. And are there any uh, comments already on this uh, outcome, uh, this uh, neck-by-neck race uh, between the two big blocks? 
Well, I mean, the first comment is my comment because, you know, the entire country has only seen these uh, exit polling results for 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. But my comment would be that, again, two of the polls, exit polls showing that the right wing bloc is ahead are entirely within the range of the uh, opinion surveys that we saw in the weeks prior to the election. However, if the one channel that has the, the, the blocks exactly even at 60 seats each, if that one is correct, it will be a major surprise because there have been very few surveys throughout the entire election period that show the two blocks even. And when I say blocks, again, I mean the right wing parties versus the center plus left plus Arab parties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even if they are even at 60-60, which is surprising, it will still be difficult for blue and white to form a government unless they are significantly ahead uh, of Likud. And that's because the with uh, fewer seats in their bloc, not exactly 60, because the Arab parties won't go in. They won't invite them in. Yeah, yeah. And is, uh, is already uh, uh, clear if any Arab country uh, uh, surpassed the threshold? Party. Yeah, party. Yes, it looks like Hadash uh, together with Tib. Oh, the tunnel. The tunnel again. I think we, we, we make a round and then we will we will have because Peter has all, also results, so we can have a round to resume the results again. Perhaps Ach so. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dalia? Uh, yes. Yeah, the connection is. Uh, was there a tunnel again? Because we, we lost you again. Yeah. Sorry. No, no and tunnel, but it might have just been a poor reception area. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Shall I, shall I review what I said about Khadash? It looks like Khadash, the Arab party in mm -hmm. coalition with Ahmed Tibi's party, looks like it's crossing the threshold, I believe, okay. in all of the surveys, but I'm not sure. And Balad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, I think we. Perhaps, Nico, kannst du vielleicht dann nochmal mit. Nico. Dalia, I um, hand you over to Nico, whom you know uh, from our Berlin yeah. office, and we we yeah. take the the audience back to the to the panel and discuss the uh, the results. And thank you very much for your time, and hopefully you have thank a safe you. Uh, journey uh, to Jerusalem. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Dalia. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the listeners. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Peter. Peter Lindel is uh, working on his smartphone. So the exit polls show us. Could you please show the party table again? Then I can tell you how many seats each party obtained. Well, I give you an average from three exit polls. The average on the right, the right parties will uh, obtain five seats. The wood is out. But only in two out of three polls, the new right is also out. Nobody has predicted this. But again, average. Israel Betsenu uh, obtained four seats. Likud, 35 seats. Also, uh, not far cast, Shas and Jura Judaism, both seven seats. This is a huge surprise. Kulanu, 
Four seats. Gescher is out. Kahol Lavan, Benny Guns obtained 37 seats. Labour Party, seven seats. Merits on average five, and it's important here, but it is in in each of the three polls. Rambalat is out. Khadashtal obtained six seats. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So let's have one final elephant round as to the uh, options for alliances. So please speculate, and then we will finish, but you are all invited to continue the discussion downstairs. But what is your idea? What could happen now? First, let me uh, water down the wine a bit. The exit poles should be taken with a grain of salt. Likud voters have a kind of tradition. So in an exit poll, they often uh, give wrong information. And with the uh, at the last uh, election, people thought that uh, Herzog would uh, become prime minister, but uh, then the, uh, it was Netanyahu. Two polls, the right block has a majority uh, in uh, one poll. It is 60-60. This is a big surprise. Should this be the outcome, 60-60, the only option is uh, for, it's the only option for Benny Guns to get a majority. The five parties to the left must prevent that the uh, uh, right-wing forces get a majority. In all other countries, Netanyahu will form a pure right-wing bloc or ask Benny Gantz uh, to be his defense minister. Well, I agree. Actually, I suspect a shift to the right for the reasons you mentioned. What we have already seen is that the two big parties uh, were strengthened. So it was also an attempt uh, during the last days of the election campaign. So uh, it will be important what party can really uh, get over the threshold. This is difficult to say now, but I expect a slight shift to the left. And then now, coalition fantasies. Who could potentially, if Kahola won, scored well, who could um, move from the uh, uh, right to the left. Moshe Kolano, there's this rumor that he um, could defect. But the, um, uh, he is uh, Wuldeid uh, Likudnik, and before he gives up on, on uh, uh, Netanyahu, Kolaban would uh, score. Uh, would need to score extremely well. So, so I think that this projection would change, but that would still be uh, sufficient. You would need an ultra orthodox uh, party. Um, um is part of that um, uh, alliance. So this is difficult to conceive. So it's off the mic. Sorry, I can't hear this. Uh, 
ask them said that he will not support a uh, bill that gives Netanyahu immunity uh, and he don't want to be uh, sitting in a coalition with an indicted prime minister. I don't believe this because there would be real politics. Uh, He's not. He is not in favor of this immunity law. Yes. Uh, anyway. <laughs> now the question of coalitions with Netanyahu is under a difficult uh, light. If he's indicted, then it could be that you uh, uh, enter into a coalition that is over soon, or you uh, pass a bill that gives him immunity. What uh, reminds us a bit of Romania, I would like to uh, give an aspect which should not be um, underestimated. Um, Ruben Rivlin plays an important role because he is the one uh, um, to order uh, uh, government forming and Netanyahu tried to pressure him uh, in recent months that he uh, turns the page to his um, benefit. And, uh, and Rifflin um, uh, successful in, in fending that off. And so it remains to be seen how he will interpret his scope. OK, now it is difficult uh, to uh, deliver a concluding remark uh, that we can uh, deliver so that you are um, happy um, homegoers. So we will be hearing lots of interpretations and first reactions from uh, <clears throat> those who ran for office. So we as the Burl Foundation will continue to strive for ecology, human rights, and uh, two-state solution and in Israel and Palestine with our offices in Ramallah as well. So um, stay tuned. Um, enjoy the evening. Use it for extensive exchange. Thanks for being here. I wish you a pleasant evening.